begin with that uh, Memorare prayer to St. Joseph, which is on page 240 in the hard copy book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Remember, O most chaste spouse of the Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to you, my spiritual Father, and beg your protection. O foster Father of the Redeemer, despise not my petitions, but in your goodness hear and answer me. Amen. Heavenly Father, on this day 21, we come to you uh, wanting to imitate the great faith of St. Joseph, that living faith that he had, that trusting faith that he had. We want to have that too, Heavenly Father, and we want to have that desire to be in the presence of Jesus and to adore him, to gaze upon him, to know that we are in the presence of the God-man and to rejoice that we're able to do that. Uh, we pray for that gift for ourselves and for everyone, that we would come to realize the real presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. And as always, we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, guys. So we are on day 21, and it's uh, that makes three weeks we've been doing this. So that's, that's uh, wonderful. I have to say, in my opinion, it's gone by quick. It really does not seem like we've been doing this for three weeks. I'd give it maybe, I don't know, 15 days or so, but uh, yeah, three weeks. Okay, so a few notes from yesterday and an update. Um, I have a lot of people writing me, especially private messages, um, asking me, when is the Spanish going to be coming out? Um, I, well, I don't have a set date. I couldn't tell you, like, you know, September 1st, like a day. But it, the latest word is September. So they're doing the translation right now. Um, it's almost done. It'll probably be done in another week or so. And then they've got to take another look at it, you know, to make sure everything's theologically correct. And uh, then we've got to send it. We've got to wait in line. You just don't send it to the printers like, hey, print this tomorrow, especially when you're printing massive quantities like we will. Uh, so it, you have to get in line and everything's got to be done. Um, and, you know, that takes time. So um, but don't worry. It's 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 getting there. Um, and people from all over the world are asking for the Spanish. It's it's really wonderful. A lot of people um, have been contacting me from uh, especially uh, Central and South America but also a lot of Latinos uh, here in the United States have been wanting it. So that's that's great. Um, in line with that, in union with that, it looks like actually the first version translated book that we're going to have of Consecration of St. Joseph is actually going to be the French. Um, that is going to start selling on June 30th. Um, I don't have all the details yet, but it seems that the translation is done. It's at the printers now. And this is in France, by the way. So um, it's a little, I mean, it's great that they've done it, but I think they kind of, they, they must have beat Canada to it because um, it, from the United States perspective, it'd be easier for us here if it was, you know, being printed uh, and shipped from Canada. But it doesn't look like that's going to be happening unless they get the French book from France. So there's a press there that has uh, translated it. So tomorrow... On the Facebook page, there will be posted where you can get it in France. And you, you're going to be able to get it from all different kind of places in France. But it's going to be printed and shipped from France. It will not be printed or shipped from the United States, the French version. Um, there's just not enough demand for that here in the United States. Not yet, anyway. Maybe there will be. But right now, there just isn't. So um, France is doing it. So I'll post that. That will be posted tomorrow on the Consecration to St. Joseph with Father Calloway Facebook page where you can uh, pre-order it, but it's only going to be like another two to three weeks before uh, it'll be shipping out. So, all right. And then one last thing, quite a few people have asked me over the last three weeks, Father, are you going to do an audio book? Yes. Great news there. That is also the contract is being signed. Um, they're going to try and have me read the introduction, um, not the whole thing. I mean, that would be cool. But uh, that's going to be a little challenging because once I start traveling again, 
uh, that's just going to be a little tricky because you want to do it in the same place where the sound is always going to be the same. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be on the move again starting soon. So, um, so they want me to do the, read the introduction and then uh, they're going to have somebody else, a guy, read the book. So that's going to be exciting because a lot of people, they do those um, when they're driving or when they're traveling in, a, in airports, planes, whatever, uh, or even at home, of course. Uh, for audiobooks. So that's exciting, guys. So it looks like all this stuff is coming together uh, and uh, really happy about that. Okay, so we got a lot of ground to cover today, my friends. Today is day 21, where we read from the litany of St. Joseph, Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Starting off with a quote from St. Pope John Paul II, the church admires the simplicity and the depth of his, St. Joseph's, Faith. So, St. Joseph is a model of faith. Faith, as you know, is one of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. But what, what exactly is faith? You know, you hear it, but what, what exactly is it? How is it defined? So, the letter to the Hebrews gives us a good definition. It says, faith is the assurance of things to hope for and the conviction of things not seen. So that's a, that's a good definition. And if you want to take it a little step further, because that basically is saying that faith is knowledge of things that you can't see, and you're waiting, you're anticipating, and you believe them. Uh, you believe that, it, that it's real, that it that it's, exists. But you can take it a step further and have what many people talk about and what the church actually talks about is a living faith. So it's not just some a knowledge. Because think about this, and I, and I write this here, somewhere here. Uh, yeah, just below here. A Christian is called to have a faith, to have faith in Jesus and trust in him. This is what trust is, by the way. It's that living faith. It's, it's faith in action. It's, it's taking it a step further. And this is why we can make the distinction between just having the faith, which is knowledge, and, and knowing something is true, and then placing everything in that basket, so to speak. And, and, and living it and trusting it, no matter what. This is what I mean. Acknowledging who Jesus is, is not enough. So you can know. You can have that certain faith. You, can, you, you know who he is. Faith is a certain form of knowledge. But see, even demons acknowledge who Jesus is. Now, we, don't, we wouldn't use that terminology that they have faith, but they do have that knowledge. They don't deny that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Oh, they know it. They know it. And on certain occasions in the New Testament, they shout it out. Remember those passages? I have some of them here in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where demons cry out, we know who you are. They know. And Jesus rebukes them and tells them to be silent. What's the difference? Well, they know who he is, but they don't trust them. It's not a living faith. It's a knowledge, but it's dead. It doesn't do anything for them. They don't put it into action. They don't believe that God is trustworthy. And so it does nothing for them. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. That's certainly not what we want. Sadly, there, there's a lot of people, you know, uh, in the world who seem to have that kind of understanding of what it means to believe in Jesus. So they profess him and they believe him. And yet the things and the people that they vote for are radically opposed to what Jesus Christ is all about. Or the way that they live is radically opposed to what Jesus Christ is all about. So you might see a lot of people on, on, a, uh, and on Sunday praising the Lord. But, you know, Saturday through Friday, mm, you know, living a pretty immoral life. And that's, you know, we're, we're all sinners. We all make mistakes, right? But I mean, there's got to be some consistency there. There's got to be, Lord, I'm really going to try and stop these patterns of behavior in my life to show that not only do I know you and profess you and praise you, because, uh, I mean, anybody can lift up their hand, you know, and glory, glory, but you got to live it. It's got to be lived out. Or it's actually quite dangerous because you may not know him at all. You, you, you may know him on a piece of paper or, you know, be able to to say that you you're a Christian, but are you? Is it just as simple as that? 
or does it have to be lived out? It's got to be lived out. That's what we've been, the saints and the church has been trying to tell us for 2,000 years. It's got to be lived out. It's got to be, you know, exercised in that living, trusting way. And that's what St. Joseph did. St. Joseph held fast to Jesus' words even when his mind and his senses were unable to completely understand what Jesus meant. Joseph was not God. He didn't have a divine mind. He didn't always perfectly understand, but he trusted in everything that Jesus did and that he said. And so did Our Lady. Remember, Our Lady is not God either. So she, you know, she had to ponder and she prayed about these things and she she, she even asked the angel, how can this be, you know, in a, in a very humble way? You know, it's a good question. How, huh? it's a virgin, how? How's that going to go down, you know? But in her humility and in the humility of St. Joseph, it's a trusting, living faith. Okay, so St. Joseph never doubted the, the divinity of Jesus or his power to conquer evil. To the world, Jesus looked like an ordinary child. But St. Joseph knew he was God. St. Joseph never doubted that. He adored our Lord in the cradle, in the home in Nazareth, in the temple in Jerusalem, and as a grown man in his workshop. St. Joseph was always aware that in seeing Jesus, he was gazing upon God Almighty. And that's what we're going to get in today when we go into the wonder of the adorer of Christ. Oh, it's a fascinating wonder associated with St. Joseph. Now remember, St. Joseph is the increaser. So he wants to help us increase our faith, to have that living faith, that trust in Jesus Christ. Today, this is really needed. Because it's not easy to be faithful to Jesus. Look, I'm a priest telling you this. It is not easy. This is a messed up world where we are constantly distracted. We have so many things put in front of us that are enticing. Uh, that you know we could easily be drawn in that direction. And then we find ourselves further and further from the Lord. From things that we once held to be dear. And then the world you know, and its pleasures and its delights and its enticements just gets us. It's not easy. The world does not want you to trust Jesus, hope in his promises, or love him. If you live according to the teachings of Jesus, you will be ridiculed, guarantee it, and mocked by the world, and maybe even by your family and friends. Nowadays, really, it's not even a maybe. You will. You will. Unless your mom and dad, you know, live in a convent in a monastery and are on the exact same page with you, and all your relatives are, uh, you know, of this ilk, you know, which was great. Maybe on occasion that happens to a few here and there, but the vast majority, 99.9, you're going to have relatives who are way off, and they're going to think that you are the weirdest thing ever. They're going to think you're the most churchy freak that, you know, just a Jesus freak who is just all about, you know, all this stuff, and they're going to it's going to, you know what I'm talking about, the tension when you get together for your Thanksgiving meal, you know, <laughs> woo, it can be rough. But should you endure exile and isolation out of love for Jesus, he's worth it. Should you suffer financial loss out of love for the truth, God will reward you. If you are belittled, spoken ill of, and calumniated against because of your stance against abortion, homosexual marriage, contraception, your reward will be great. In heaven. Yes, it will. Because we've got to take a stand. You know, there's a great quote from uh, Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton. Because everybody today talks about, oh, you're so uptight. You know, you're so old-fashioned in your ways and your thinking. You've got to be more tolerant and open-minded. You should be open-minded. You're so judgmental. You know what Fulton, or uh, Chesterton said? I love this. This is brilliant from this man. He said, in response to everybody saying, be open-minded, be open-minded. He said, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. Because they will. Your mind was not to be meant to be open to everything and think that everything is the same. And it's for you to choose what's right and wrong and what, you know, uh, is, is, is light and what is dark, what is true and what is false. No, those categories, those have been given to us. And we don't accept those, and yet we still profess a belief in Jesus, something's off. Something's not right. You've made Jesus in your image, and you ain't got the real one. And that's the danger. That's a real danger. 
man, I could do this tonight. I could. I could come up with my own Jesus, and I could have me a mega church. Mm, let's just say in Texas, maybe. And I could have a lot of people throwing money at me. I could have a private jet. I could have all kind of luxuries and delights. Mm, it'd be fantastic. But would I be giving them Jesus Christ crucified and the wisdom of the cross? What the saints have been telling us for 2,000 years? No. I'd be giving them me. And it ain't about me. I ain't going to be here forever. I'm going to die at some point. But the message is the same. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And the teaching of the church doesn't change with a particular person who thinks they're really intelligent and, and wins a position and becomes you know, a leader of a certain movement or country or whatever it may be. No, that's not how it works. The truth is unchanging. And what a delight that is. What a joy that is. And that's when you have that living faith in Jesus, that trusting faith in Jesus, you don't have to worry. Oh, yeah, you're going to suffer. You're going to be persecuted. And who knows, you might be a martyr. But you, you're, you rest secure in unchanging truth. That, for me, when I discovered that in Catholicism, changed everything. Changed everything. And that's what Joseph had. That's what made him do all the things that he did, all the hardships that he endured, because he knew this as well. This is what St. John Paul II II said. It is precisely this intrepid faith of St. Joseph that the church needs today in order to courageously dedicate herself to the urgent task of the new evangelization. We need, we need intrepid faith, zealous faith, not just to be, because a lot of times today, I think Christians, and I mean a lot of Christians, feel that they're really on the offensive today because they got to watch everything. They've got to be so careful. And this is, this is difficult times that we're living in. But if we had that intrepid faith, we wouldn't be so much on the offensive as uh, on the, or on the defensive. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. On the defensive, we'd be on the offensive. We'd be going out. We'd be hunting for souls, like St. Maximilian Kolbe says. Not so much on the defensive, but going out because we know what we are. We've got it. Not arrogantly and not cramming it down people's throats or anything like that. Of course not, right? No, 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 no. But delivering to them the joy of the gospel, of giving everything to Jesus Christ and finding the freedom that he brings. And, you know, actually, on some level, St. Joseph actually did that. Now, let's get into that. Okay, so today's wonder is adorer of Christ. And we'll go to page 172 in the hard copy. And this is fascinating stuff. I prayed about this when I was writing this. And um, I was asking the Holy Spirit, help me to put this in there in a way that makes sense, because i got so many ideas coming to me, and gleaning stuff from great saints, like uh, St. Peter Julian Imard, which uh, he's probably the, the biggest one when it comes to the connection between St. Joseph and the Blessed Sacrament, which is not something that you normally think about, because St. Joseph was not alive when Jesus instituted the Eucharist, and so we just think, well, there's no connection there. St. Joseph kind of missed out on that. But there actually is. And we've, we've talked a little bit about that with the bread. Remember how our Joseph saved our bread. Jesus Christ, the true bread, come down from heaven by taking him to Egypt. And so there's a connection there, although not a lot of people have thought about that either. So hopefully that was eye-opening. But then we're going to get into to this as well today. So think about this. Think about this. Wherever St. Joseph traveled with his wife and son, his home became an adoration chapel. Nazareth, Bethlehem, and Egypt are all places where St. Joseph contemplated the divine presence of Jesus Christ and welcomed others to do the same. In that sense, St. Joseph is the founder of adoration chapels. This is the kind of stuff that St. Peter Giuliani Mar talks about. He's got a little book uh, on St. Joseph. I think it's St. Joseph for the month or something like that. You can find it. It's easy. Uh, these are a lot of where these quotes from him in the, my book come from. So he's a founder of adoration chapels and with his wife is the first to conduct a procession with the body and blood of Christ. But here's the thing. The first one that he did, he may not have even probably, well, he didn't actually, not may have, what am I saying? He didn't know he was even doing 
what am I what am I getting at there? Well, there's something quite fascinating um, about uh, the visitation, the mystery that we pray in the rosary that we read about when Our Lady went to her relative Elizabeth. So let me give you a quote here from uh, Saint Peter Julian Imard. No one can describe the adoration of this St. Joseph's noble soul. He saw nothing, yet he believed. His faith had to pierce the virginal veil of Mary. So likewise with you. Under the veil of the sacred species, the Eucharist, your faith must see our Lord. Ask St. Joseph for his lively, constant faith. Okay. So. In Nazareth, months before the angel revealed to St. Joseph that Mary was pregnant with the, with the divine child, St. Joseph was inches away from the tabernacled presence of God in Mary's womb, and he didn't even know it. Now, some of you, when we began this series, you seem to be a little confused about when Joseph found out that, was, that Mary was pregnant. So let me just go over that real quick again. Super simple. So Joseph and Mary were married. But there were two phases to a Jewish marriage. There was the marriage, and then there was they moved in together. So they were, it was, they were already married, but they weren't living together yet. When the angel came to Mary, and she accepted that invitation to become the mother of God. So if you want to look at it in three things, we could say they were married, she received the announcement, and then they moved in together. So that's the timeline of it. Because some people were saying, well, wait, I thought it was he knew already. No, he didn't know because they weren't living together. He wasn't with her when the angel came and, and, and made that announcement, the joyful annunciation. So he didn't know that his wife was pregnant. And so although they weren't living together yet, he was already, whenever he was in the presence of his wife, he was in the presence of Jesus. But he didn't know yet, just inches away tucked away within her, her, her sacred womb, you know, God was taking on flesh. God was taking on flesh. And heaven was going to be setting up the one who would be the first adorer and the great missionary of, of, of adoration chapels. And that would be Joseph. So, so check this out. So St. Joseph's wife's wife was a walking tabernacle. The incarnate God was living and growing inside St. Joseph's wife's womb and he didn't even know it. God was preparing him to be the loving father of the greatest treasure the world has ever known, the incarnate son of God. Now, as a newly married man, St. Joseph never wanted, wanted to be far away from his wife. What, what newly married man, you know, would, would want to be a, a long distance from his wife? I mean, occasionally that happens, like you hear about it in the, in the military, for example. And sometimes they intentionally get married right before he's deployed. Uh, because there's the possibility he might not be coming back, you know. So it, it, you hear about it occasionally, but it wasn't in this situation. Mary must have come to him and expressed a desire to visit her relative Elizabeth for three months. Remember, we read about that when she found out the angel had told her, your cousin, your relative Elizabeth is pregnant, you know, now far along. Um, and this, this must have really been a, a surprise to St. Joseph. Because remember, he doesn't know that his wife is pregnant. And so he's probably, you know, when she comes to him with this request, he's probably like, oh, okay, well, uh, all right, sure. What, what else would he been thinking, though? This is where we get into some fascinating stuff. When we read this episode in the New Testament, we tend to presume that Mary did not ask St. Joseph to accompany her to Elizabeth's. We think that he didn't go because we don't explicitly read it there. But is that true? The sacred text, however, does not inform us of what exactly happened on this occasion, other than telling us that Mary went in haste to the hill country. We are not told if Joseph went or not. Many saints, many saints and mystics, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Bonaventure, Bernard of Siena, Francis de Sales, Venerable Mary Begrita, Catherine of em uh, and Catherine Emmerich, and tons of others, tons of others, believe that St. Joseph did accompany Mary to Elizabeth's. Why wouldn't he go? Let me tell you something. If I had just married a woman and she tells me, um, is it okay, you know, if I go for three months to visit my relative? I'd be like, um, um, 
is something wrong? I mean, uh, am I, did I do something, you know? I would be like, oh, yeah, but um, what's going on, you know? Well, something was going on, obviously, that Mary had to wait until Joseph was was given his own annunciation because she was holding such a sacred mystery that it required silence. It required silence because some people have said, well, why didn't Mary just tell Joseph, like rush over to his place, which was right over across the street, basically, and say, honey, an angel just came to me. I'm preggers. I, I got a baby and it's God's baby. Right. Now, that's not how it works, guys. When you're dealing with such a sacred mystery, the incarnation of God, Mary is that sacred, silent tabernacle. God has to reveal this to her husband. And she knew this. Because of her intimate union with God, she never did anything contrary to the will of God. You know, we, we talk about this. Her, her union with God is unparalleled. She waited. She waited. God had, had revealed it to her through an angel. In her prayer, she knew that God, in his time, would reveal the same thing to Joseph, her husband, through an angel. And that's exactly what happened. So, what kind of husband uh, would let his young, beautiful wife make a long journey? How long? Three days. Three days walking from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I think it's something like, uh, is it like 80 miles or something like that? So it's like th a three-day journey. So the New Testament does not explicitly tell us that St. Joseph went with Mary, but it does not explicitly tell us that he didn't. And from a marital perspective, how could he stand to be away from her for so long? It actually makes a lot of sense that St. Joseph would have accompanied her to Elizabeth's and maybe even stayed there for three months, maybe. But it's kind of a no-brainer that he would have at least gone with his wife. Can you imagine if, if, if he had said, oh, okay, sure. Well, you know, you're in my thoughts and prayers. Uh, I'll be thinking about you at night when you're sleeping under the stars, uh, my young, beautiful wife out in the desert. <laughs> what kind of husband would that have been? No way, not going to happen. And so that's why we often see, now this is in my mind, or my eye rather, whenever I go to Europe now, we don't tend to have these in the United States, which is a huge bummer. Maybe we do. You can show, tell me in the comments. But when you go to Europe, do you know what you often see depicted in the cathedrals, the churches, the convents, the monasteries, all over the place? You will see somebody painted, some famous painters and less known painters, the scene of the visitation. You know who's in it all the time? Joseph. It, they, they paint him there. Look, I, my eye is open to this now. Always, when I go to Europe, I can be in a random church in the middle of nowhere, Italy, and all of a sudden, there's another one. There's another one. It shows the whole scenario. It shows Elizabeth coming out, her belly's all big. It doesn't show Mary's belly generally big, because remember, St. Joseph still at that time would not have known. She had just been told, you know, about the Annunciation. But there he is. So, I mean, it's almost, you could make up your own scenario of, you know, the women doing their thing. And then there's, you know, Elizabeth's husband and Joseph's like, hey, what's up, man? Good to see you. You know, I mean, putting in my words, but you know what I mean? It, it probably happened like this, really and truly. And remember the baby that was in Elizabeth's womb, who was that? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So at some point, at some point, Joseph, our Joseph, knew St. Saint, Saint John the Baptist. Maybe, maybe, maybe he wasn't there for, for the three months when Elizabeth gave birth to her son, John the Baptist. But here's some fascinating stuff, my friends. Hope I'm not getting ahead of myself because I'm looking at you without looking at my book. Oh, you know what? Yeah, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll go back because there's something I want to read to you that's really cool. What would Joseph have heard? Even if he just accompanied her and then left and went back home to do wor his work, which is very possible, too. He could have walked there with her to keep her safe and then said to her, um, I'll be back on such and such a date and um, we'll, we'll go back together so that he could continue to make money for the family, you know, in Nazareth doing his manual labor and everything. But what would he have heard when he and Mary came upon the, the house of Elizabeth? Think it through. Well, he would have heard Elizabeth come out and say, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? 
Would he have understood it? No. He wouldn't have. He didn't know his wife was pregnant. He would have been like, hmm, that's interesting. What's going on there? You know what his response would have been? To ponder, to pray. He did that constantly, just like Our Lady did. So he wouldn't have got it at that time. But I guarantee you, if, if he was there and he heard it, and then what would he have heard, actually? After Elizabeth said that, what would he have heard his wife say? My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Her Magnificat. Joseph would have heard his wife, that song, that canticle. Yes, think it through. If he was there, that's what he would have heard. And then if he left and went back to Nazareth by himself, that three days journey, and then there for three months without his wife, he would have been praying about that. Why did Elizabeth say that? What was that all about? Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Basically saying I'm not worthy. Huh. And then what was my beloved saying? My soul, it was a beautiful song. What was it again? She said, right? He would have been going over that. That's why when Mary came back, and Joseph realized that she was pregnant, because that's when he discovered it. Why? Because she was gone for three months, and her belly became big. And then he would have seen it, and then he would have been like, Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Isaiah, the virgin, shall be with child. Oh, my gosh. My wife. She's the one. My Mary. She's the one. And that's why he would have not have thought about divorcing her. Come on. He would have done what exactly what Elizabeth did. Who am I? That the mother of my Lord should come to me. I can't do this. I'm not worthy. Oh, my. Oh, Lord, my God. Show me the way because she belongs to you. You have made a virgin pregnant with your, your, your son. I, I can't do this. That's what it's all. That's what's going on down here. Not, not so much of what, you know, people have been talking about this divorce narrative. That, that just don't make sense in light of what we've, we've got in paintings. We've got in saints and mystics have talked about this. And what I got, I'm telling you, is in my book. This is what we're dealing with here. So let's back up because I, I skipped ahead, but I want to back up because Venerable Mary of Agreda has written down. Remember, she was the mystic who, you know, wrote down the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she was privileged to be able to go back in time, so to speak, and see a lot of this stuff being played out. So she heard a conversation take place between the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph after Mary had received her annunciation. But remember, St. Joseph not yet knowing that his wife was pregnant. So this is what Mary said to Joseph and what Joseph said to Mary. Mary to St. Joseph. My Lord and my husband. Ooh, some feminists just got really upset. But remember what we said, that whole Lord terminology, it's not meant, you know, as, you know, my God or anything like that. It's the masculine form of what we say when we call Mary, Our Lady. It's a title of honor, of respect, and acknowledging, you know, his place in that marriage. So don't be tripping on that. If you've missed it so far, go back and read that section where I talk about that. And all these, all these saints refer to St. Joseph as my Lord. So don't, don't be losing it now. My Lord and my husband. It has pleased the Lord, capital L. See, it's small L for Joseph, but capital L when he's referring to God. My Lord and husband, it has pleased the Lord to enlighten me, informing me that my cousin Elizabeth, uh, despite being infertile, is now expecting a long-desired child. Therefore, I think it may be suitable that I go and visit her to be of assistance and spiritual comfort to her. If, my Lord, this is in accordance with your will, I shall do so. Consider yourself what may be best and command me what I am to do. What a lovely exchange. What a lovely exchange. And what is Joseph's response? Listen to this. St. Joseph to Mary, you know well. My lady and my wife. See, he's also calling her Lord, just in the feminine form. That's what domina is the feminine for, form of, you know, Lord. My lady and my wife, that your desires are mine and that I trust fully in your prudence. Ooh, we talked about prudence the other day. Since your most honest will would incline to nothing that was not of great satisfaction to the Most High. So I believe it to be with this journey. 
And so that it may, may not appear strange that you undertake it without the company of your husband, I shall follow you with joy to be of use to you on the way until you have reached your destination. No brainer right there, my friends. See, we just assume that something that's not explicitly in Scripture means it didn't happen. But it just makes sense. God gave us a brain. He wants us to use it. What husband would not accompany his wife on such a journey? So I really and truly believe that he did. All right. Um, moving along here. All right. I covered all this stuff because I jumped ahead a little bit. But I wanted. I was so excited about it, I just kind of went ahead there. Okay. Here's something fascinating, too. Whether St. Joseph accompanied Mary to, to Elizabeth's or not, because that stuff from, you know, I have to be honest, the stuff from Venerable Mary Greta and all the other saints is just their own thoughts and, you know, it, it's their own understanding of it, which I think is true. Uh, and the church has never said was not true. So you you can believe it, right? But whether or not he did or, or go to, with her or didn't, he most likely traveled with his wife and son after Jesus was born, and they were living in Nazareth, to see Elizabeth and Zechariah and their son, John the Baptist, on what we could call later visitations, small v. Normal. Don't you go and visit your relatives? Sure you do. For various things, I don't know, birthdays or various celebrations, or you got, you know, some kind of family reunion or something. I don't know. Now, granted, the Elizabeth and Zechariah were, were old. But nonetheless, why is it, again, when you see those paintings, many of them uh, in Europe, not only depicting Joseph at the, uh, at the visitation, but many of these artists throughout the centuries also go a few years past that, and they show the Holy Family with the family of Elizabeth, Zechariah, and John the Baptist. So what do you see? You will see the little boy Jesus playing with the little boy John the Baptist. And who's in the background? Joseph. Now, that didn't happen at the visitation because, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist didn't just, you know, come out as already formed little children, you know, three years old. They went through the normal process of growth. So that means, artistically anyway, and just thinking it through, probably later on, because, you know, this area, by the way, uh, it's called uh, Ein Kerem, uh, where it is. It's it's close to Jerusalem. Uh, when they would have had to go to Jerusalem three times a year, remember father and son, and probably Mary went sometimes too, they would have probably said, hey, let's swing by, you know, uh, Elizabeth and Zachariah, see them, see how John's doing, John the Baptist. That's why Joseph would have known John the Baptist. Have you ever thought of that? Did you ever think that St. Joseph knew John the Baptist? St. Joseph might have actually held John the Baptist on his arms like he would have his own son, parading him around in his arms like a father and son do. Would have maybe, you know, done certain things with John the Baptist or at least watched his own son, Jesus, play with John the Baptist. They were relatives. They were very similar in age. Did you ever think about that? Well, that leads to some meditations, huh? Sure does. See, whenever I pray the rosary now and some of those joyful meditate wrote mysteries, this stuff comes to my mind. I don't want to leave out Joseph. I don't want to leave out some of these things that, uh, you know, we, we, we can think about and in all likelihood took place. Fascinating stuff. Okay. Uh, I got a quote here. Oh, this is a good one. This is where we're going to get into that whole adoration idea of St. Joseph being the first adorer of Christ, and the first missionary of the real presence of Jesus Christ. So if the first procession um, with Jesus was to Elizabeth's house, remember, if Joseph accompanied Mary, he didn't even know that Mary was pregnant. But nonetheless, he accompanied, you know, uh, the, the tabernacle presence of God, Mary's sacred womb with, with the, the God man residing, you know, in, in, in her womb. If that was the first procession, the second took place when St. Joseph journeyed with his pregnant wife to Bethlehem. To Bethlehem to enroll in the census. And this is why this venerable Joseph uh, Menzenti, he says this, St. Joseph went in haste with Mary to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, so that the bread of eternal life might be born there. By the way, did you know that? 
this is going to blow your mind. If you weren't aware of this, because a lot of people think, oh, Catholics, they just made this stuff up, talking about the Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, Holy Communion. You know, they're just kind of fudging this stuff so that we, you know, have to buy into it. Oh, no, 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 my friends. No, no, no. The true bread come down from heaven. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. In Hebrew, Bethlehem means house of bread. I'm not kidding. In, in uh, Is it Aramaic or Arabic? One of those two, I forget. It means house of meat, house of flesh. Not kidding, guys. And this is where the Messiah was born. And even more specifically, our bread came down from heaven, was born in the place called the house of bread or the house of meat. Interesting, that means both things, doesn't, isn't it? And where was he placed? In a manger where animals eat, from where we get the word manjare, eat. Not kidding. This is, this, is, this is the stuff of Christianity. This is the reality of what's in the scriptures. This is what we're dealing with here. And St. Joseph was aware of all of this. And when people came, he didn't hold them off. He wanted them to adore. When the wise men came and the shepherds came and they gave gifts, he let it happen because he knew this is the divine child. This is the son of God. And he welcomed them. He welcomed them. That is amazing. So then he set up uh, another adoration chapel. And this is where he got super bold. This is why he's the first missionary, St. Joseph. He took Jesus to Egypt. He took the real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ into pagan territory. St. Joseph is bold. That's what he did. Yep. Doesn't mean it was easy, but he did it. And if anybody was there who was willing to come and spend time with them, he would have welcomed them to spend time in the presence of God. This is great stuff. This is what some saints have picked up on, like St. Peter Julian and Mar, and written, you know, mat great material on this. So after their time in Egypt, St. Joseph and Mary walked with Jesus to Nazareth. To this day, this walk was and remains the grandest procession of the body blood of, blood of Christ ever conducted. It was a procession that covered more than 120 miles. Now, it was not a Eucharistic procession because that Jesus would institute the Eucharist at the Last Supper, but it's the same body, blood, soul, and divinity. And the amazing thing is at some points, I'm sure that Joseph probably would have carried him, just like a priest does today in a monstrance. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're dealing with here. St. Joseph is the first one. He's the first adore, the first one to, 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 you know, expose him, so to speak. Mary carried him. She's the monstrance. But St. Joseph, in a certain sense, carried both her and the divine one within. Oh, man. Even as I'm saying this, I just want to run to a chapel. and It's amazing what we're dealing with here, what St. Joseph, who he is, what he's done. And because he did it, we can do it today. That's why without St. Joseph, we wouldn't have the bread. We've talked about that. Without, which means without St. Joseph, we wouldn't have adoration. Without St. Joseph, we wouldn't have all these things. But how, how much have we neglected this reality? For 2,000 years, we've neglected this. To give him his rightful place and to recognize what he's done. Okay, I'm going to read you a quote from... Uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori. Well, I'm going to read a passage, then I'm going to read that quote because they go together. So once in Nazareth, St. Joseph and his wife adored the divine presence of Jesus in their home for decades. In one sense, it was like a house of perpetual adoration and uninterrupted contemplation, even while they carried out their daily tasks and chores of domestic life. The adoration lasted for decades. So here's that quote from St. Alphonsus Liguori. Makes so much sense. If the two disciples going to Emmaus, remember, after the resurrection, if the two disciples going to Emmaus were inflamed with divine love by the few moments which they spent in company with our Savior and by his words, so much so that they said, was not our heart burning within us while he spoke to us on the way? What flames of holy love must we not suppose to have been enkindled in the heart of St. Joseph? who for 30 years conversed with Jesus Christ and listened to his words of eternal life. 
Wow. No kidding. No kidding. So I want to go somewhere here where I love to talk about this. Those who go on my pilgrimages and read my other books, I've talked about this. Something profound. Have you ever heard of fetal microchimerism? What? Yeah, don't worry. It's in the book. You can look it up on Google too. Fetal microchimerism, sometimes also called fetal maternal microchimerism. It's a long, complicated term, I know, but it revealed something wonderful about the biological connection between a mother and a child. And this means even if St. Joseph was outside of the home, away on a work project, or uh, or rather if Jesus was away from the house, if he was out, maybe he you know, wanted to go off and be on his own for a period of time or something, which most likely happened, right? But even if Jesus was outside of the home, Joseph... In light of what I'm about to tell you in this scientific discovery, which only happened in the last 20 years, called fetal microchimerism, St. Joseph was still in the presence of Jesus Christ. Check this out, guys. Check this out. Fetal microchimerism is the scientific term that describes a process in which living cells of a child remain in the body of a mother after her pregnancy has ended. Yeah, science has proven this. In the late 20th century, scientists discovered that when a woman becomes pregnant and after she has given birth, there are cells from her baby that remain in the mother's body. Many of these cells remain in her body for the rest of her life. That means all of you right now watching this, it don't matter where you live or who you are or how old you are, you got living cells of your mother in your body right now, just like I do. Wow. Many of these cells remain in her body for the rest of her life. Scientists and researchers have also discovered that the cellular exchange occurs in the other direction as well. Cells of the mother are exchanged with her children and remain in the bodies of her children for life. For life. That means that my mom right now has cells of me in her body, living cells. Wow. That is amazing. And there's a lot that I could go in here. I don't have time to. If you want to read about this in another book I wrote, get the book called Under the Mantle. I wrote a book called Under the Mantle where I unpack this because these cells in the mother's body um, defend her. They protect her when she's sick and ill. And what cells were in Mary's body? Oh, that's right. The cells of the God man. Could Mary ever die like you and I would die? Yeah, I don't think so. Hmm. That's maybe why the church has never defined something like that. We talk about Mary's assumption. We don't talk about her being corrupt in a tomb. Uh -uh. Nope. Wow. Oh, my gracious, right? Now, check this out. Though St. Joseph knew nothing of fetal microchimerism, he didn't know about this, you know, 2,000 years ago, but God continued to bless him with the presence of Jesus on a cellular level whenever he was in the presence of his wife. And here's the thing. This is the glory of Catholicism. To be near Mary is to be near Jesus. Jesus lives in her. Even after he's born through her holy womb, he remained in a real presence on a cellular level. That's why she is a walking tabernacle. Mary has in her body some of her divine son's living cells. Our Lord didn't need to be in the house for St. Joseph to remain in the presence of God. Wherever Mary was, Jesus was. St. Joseph's wife is a living tabernacle, a walking monstrance, a veiled temple. No wonder demons don't dare come near the Blessed Virgin Mary, because she's never without the divine presence. God lives inside that woman. Look it up. Google it. Get my book, Under the Mantle. Fetal Microchimerism. See, science now, as wonderful as it is, we've got a greater science, theological science. And what, what they now slowly are catching up with what we've already known. We've talked about this. We, we haven't used those scientific terms, but we've talked about this. We've talked about for 2,000 years how that woman is unique, special, different, Ark of the Covenant, living tabernacle, monstrance, temple of God. And now even science backs it up with this new discovery, only made literally, I think, within like the last 25 years. I was in seminary when um, it all became known. It's so incredible to think about, to ponder, and to pray about. And for those of you who are mothers, 
It's very touching. Very touching. If you've ever experienced the tragedy of losing one of your children, which is not the norm, right? Usually parents would die first. But if you've experienced something like, like that, your child is still with you on a cellular level. Let that sink in. Yes. And even if, if you've made a horrible decision, right? Even if you've done something horrible, which there's lots of mercy for us as long as we repent from what we've, we've done. If you've had an abortion, right? Horrible. Should never be done, of course. And there's no, no exceptions. That child is still with you. You're a mother. That child is no longer here. And praise God, if you've repented for that, received his mercy, mercy for, for all of us, the child is still with you. If you've suffered a miscarriage, which many women, mothers undergo, it's a very sad, very difficult time in the life of a, of a mother and a husband, a family, very difficult time. That child on a cellular level is still with you. This is so comforting. I can't tell you the women that I've talked to about this, the tears that flow, the reality of that connection. See, there is a bond between a mother and, and, a, and a child that is unique, unique. We as fathers, we don't get to participate in this. Uh, even though St. Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus, it wouldn't have mattered if he was because there, that, it doesn't happen that way. It's only between the mother and the children. It's special. We talk about this, a mother's intuition. My mom has this. My mom knows if I'm not having a good day, my mom can be 2,000 miles away and she knows some, something's not right. She can she picks up on it somehow. It's an intuition. You know, when the scientists dis discovered this like 25 years ago, uh, they are actually trying to write about it and say, we think we figured out a mother's intuition. You know how, how we always say, you know, a mom, it's like she's, you know, uh, she knows and she's, you know, got that sense of, of what's going on. And she's looking over your shoulder. Mom's always looking over your shoulder. They said, no, mom's not looking over your shoulder. She's in your shoulder. <laughs> really? My mom's cells somewhere are in my body right now, living cells. And my cells are in her body right now, living cells. There is a bond there between mother and son. That's the uniqueness of, of, of Jesus and Mary. St. Joseph was in the presence of that. Even when Jesus left from underneath the roof and went out to cut wood or went fishing or whatever, you know, went off for a couple of days to pray in the wilderness. <laughs> Mary, Mary was carrying his living self still in that home, in her body. Man. <laughs> what? Yep, I'm not making this stuff up, guys. I am not making this up. I hope that you guys know about this. If you don't, you got to dig into it and find out. All right, we're going to end here, I think. I've covered pretty much everything that I wanted to cover. Ah, oh, let me say one more thing. St. Peter Julian Mard, in light of this reality of St. Joseph being the first adorer, the first missionary of adoration, basically, says that we need to take up his place. The church needs Joseph's to be in front of those tabernacles, to, to him, to be in adoration, to be in worship, because that's what Joseph did. And that's what we need to do. This is why, no kid, this is why we got to be an apparition of Joseph. This is why we have to be another Joseph. We can do this. We can fulfill this now. Let's ask St. Joseph to help us. St. Joseph, help me to adore like you adored. Give me your heart, that most chaste heart, to, to be, you know, before our Lord's true presence in, in the tabernacle, to adore him, to love him, to smother him with love. Like you did. And listen to this quote from St. Peter Julian Imar. We must beg for good adorers. The Blessed Sacrament needs them to replace St. Joseph and to imitate his life of adoration. Become another Joseph for Jesus and Mary. That's one of the best things that you can do because you yourself will be transformed. You will become holy. You will grow in incredible ways, my friends. Okay, so today we pray the Litany of St. Joseph in English, and that's on page 233. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. 
Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Holy Mary, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector, you who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the intrepid faith of St. Joseph, that living, trusting faith. We thank you that he took care of our mother Mary as she journeyed, took care of all of her needs, looking after her with that great love. We thank you that he took care of Jesus, the true bread come down from heaven. We thank you that he gave us an example of adoration, of being filled with missionary zeal to bring Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity to others. Help us to have that same zeal, that same fervor in our hearts, and help us to replace him now in churches around the world, on our knees, before the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And my friends, may Almighty God bless you, your families, and especially for, for the conversion of loved ones. The blessing of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, don't leave yet, guys, because I got today's the uh, contest stuff. Got to go over that for all of those of you who are not aware of it. Um, went a little long today. I apologize, but that was some great material, guys. That stuff is like absolutely incredible. All right, so on the last five days of our consecration here, I will be giving away 50 free items, 10 copies of the book. I sign them and I mail those to you myself. And 10 copies of each of these. So 10 copies of this canvas image here, which is the cover of the book, of course. And you can buy these on consecration to stjoseph.org. But I'm going to be giving away 10 each of these. 10 of these, St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. St. Joseph, ooh, think about this one now in light of what I just told you. But look at that, look at that. The Immaculata and the Terror of Demons. That's my personal favorite commissioned image there. And then the uh, St. Joseph Terror of Demons here, this one. So you can participate in the contest and enter into the contest by simply going to Amazon and doing a review of the book, Consecration to St. Joseph. It can be one sentence. That's fine. Uh, that enters you in. And on the last five days, each day I give away 10 items. And I will do it in your presence on an iPad. Just you're a winner, you're a winner, you're a winner. And we'll work it out and we'll get the items to you. So just do a review of Consecration to St. Joseph on Amazon, and you're entered in to the contest. Okay, my friends, remember, Ite Ad Yosef, go to Joseph. God bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow.